watch for moving fish. And a moving fish doesn't necessarily feed, mean that fish is feeding, but it tells you there's more than one or two actively swimming fish in an area. And if you're not seeing fish in the area you're fishing, then pull those anchors and get over there. I'm always scanning the water looking for active fish. I have a three fish rule. If I see three fish move, I'm out of here. That was Brian Chan describing how he actively fishes a trout lake. A long time coming for this one, so I hope you enjoy it. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Get a chance, uh, take a moment and leave a five-star review for this podcast if you've been enjoying it. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash love, L-O-V-E. Uh, and if you do that, uh, I'll find some way to make it up to you. I appreciate you uh, for supporting the podcast. Brian Chan is finally here to share his Kamloops story and a step-by-step to planning and fishing Kamloops for the first time. Brian talks about how he starts fishing a lake from early morning and throughout the day. We also find out which patterns he focuses on. We kind of walk through all the big ones today. And of course, a deep dive into coronamids. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Koffler Boats specialize in custom-ordered aluminum boats and uses the best materials, components, and accessories available to meet all of your fishing and boating needs. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to check out the lineup right now. That's Koffler, K-O-F-F-L-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to check out uh, the lineup and to connect with Joe. This was everything I hoped for and more. So without further ado, here is Brian Chan from riseformflyfishing.com. How are you doing today, Brian? Oh, we're... uh... Good today. We're a little hot up here, and it's uh, unfortunately a little smoky. Oh, yeah. So the fires have already. It's so it's hot up there as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. We've we've broke record temperatures in uh, the in British Columbia. We've got this heat dome sitting over the province that we've never had temperatures like we're experiencing the last seven days. Wow. Yeah. Well, we probably we might touch a little bit on that as we go. Um, you know, I did want to start out just, you know, for you yourself, obviously for people that don't know you, you know, you're probably, you know, maybe the biggest name in the Stillwater game. Uh, it seems like you've done everything you can do out there. We're going to talk about that, like what's left to, to be done for you. Um, but yeah, let's just talk about how you first got into fly fishing. You know, uh, I first got into fly fishing, um, after, <laughs> After reading a couple magazine articles when I was very young in in outdoor life and field and stream magazines, my dad used to subscribe to them. And it, we, my dad was an avid saltwater salmon fisherman. So, uh, you know, I was born on uh, fishing for salmon in the ocean. But reading those couple articles really tweaked my interest in fly fishing. And uh, I kind of... Uh, kind of grew that passion you know i i ended up taking some fly casting lessons when i was probably uh, nine or ten years old uh, that were offered by a local fly fishing club in vancouver british columbia where i was uh born and raised and uh you know from there it uh it it, it just fascinated me the the casting of the fly and then uh and then, you know, having the chance to actually catch a fish on it. So that's pretty good. And you you got started, I mean, obviously really early. And I know the story, there's plenty of podcasts out there where you've talked about how, you, you know, pretty much you've always had this love of fishing, always knew you were going to be a, a biologist. And, and you've kind of done it, right? You've done it all. What, um, how did the, how did the lake, the, like the Stillwater thing get started? So as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I spent my childhood fishing for salmon in the ocean. And the way we fished uh, back then was uh, we were anchored and we would fish with herring strip or live needlefish or live herring that we raked. Or um, in, in some situations, you were able to purchase live herring. So I was quite used to fishing from an anchored boat. 
But but uh, one of my childhood friends uh, invited me up to the interior of BC to a lake that they went to every year uh, for a week of uh, fishing. And uh, of course, we weren't fly fishing, but uh, we we actually were using uh, because I was so used to using live live bait in the ocean. <laughs> We were we were capturing uh, live dragonfly nymphs and, and suspending them under a, a plastic float, and uh, we we just caught a ton of fish, a lot more fish than all the adults did put together. Uh, and that that trip to the interior, it really uh, on a lake, it, it it really did tweak my interest. And and uh, you know I uh, I was so fascinated with catching fish and fishing in general that I knew that. When I when I eventually grew up, I wanted to do something with fish and work with fish, and you know that led me on, uh, to have a very fortunate educational career path uh, that resulted in uh, you know right after high school getting into a two-year technical uh, institutional program where I, I learned about uh, fish and wildlife uh, technical uh, job aspects and. Uh, uh, so I got a diploma in fish and wildlife management, uh, and then um, um, started getting work in the, in the fisheries field. And uh, was very fortunate to uh, several years later to uh, win a competition for a, a regional fisheries technician job for the province. And I had my pick of where I wanted to go, and I chose Kamloops because that's the place where I had fished before. And uh, you know, from there, I was able to uh, uh, get on into a, a permanent position, and then uh, uh, I took a, after a couple of years, I took a leave of absence and uh, went back to university to get finish uh, a degree in uh, freshwater ecology, and then uh, basically spent 30 years managing uh, recreational fisheries, trout fisheries, both. Uh, yeah, uh, mainly in uh, lakes, small lakes, because we had literally thousands of them in the region I was working, and also doing work on uh, rivers and streams as well. So it was a tremendous uh, uh, career that, uh, you know, I, I doubt there were very many days where I wasn't excited to go to work. And, uh, of course, working on lakes and um, spending my free time fishing, you know, I, I got uh, got to know the lakes uh, fairly well, and I had some great mentors uh, during my uh, fishing career. Uh, famous, uh, well, well, now famous anglers from the uh, Kamloops area that took me under their wing and uh, uh, taught me some of the subtleties about uh, fishing lakes and hatches and. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of in a nutshell where you know where my addiction to uh, fly fishing, particularly in still waters, come from. Gotcha. Okay, so so yeah, basically, uh, roughly 1980 to 2010 was that kind of the time fer- period where you were managing the Kamloops. Yeah, ex- exactly. I was uh, basically a fisheries biologist and uh, intensively managing small lake trout fisheries. Uh, and then, uh, the, the, actually the last, uh, five years of my career, I was uh, asked to join the newly created Freshwater Fishery Society, BC, uh, which was a not-for-profit, uh, organization that, uh, delivers the provincial stocking program. Um, so at that time, the government said, uh, we need to get rid of government employees and uh, move things to the private sector. So they picked on the uh, provincial fish culture program. And uh, in the end, it, it worked out that they became a not-for-profit society. And the province, the provincial government, uh, changed the funding model. Whereas up until then, uh, when you bought a freshwater fishing license, uh, the money went into general revenue, provincial coffers. Uh, and then the uh, fisheries management, as well as fish stocking programs, got the crumbs out of that general revenue. 
Well, when they created the society, they directed the license revenue from the sale of those uh, freshwater licenses to go directly to the society to uh, maintain and sustain the provincial stocking program as well as uh, deliver uh, programs for uh, educating anglers on how to fish, um, uh, make an easier access to go fishing. Um, and uh, the programs grew from there to uh, uh, assisting uh, the provincial fisheries management biologists in, uh, in assessing uh, lakes and rivers uh, and streams uh, for population assessment and uh, enhancement opportunities. So it was a great way to uh, basically end, uh, end a career working with fish. There you go. No, that's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Freshwater uh, Fishery Society. So that was roughly started in 2005. Uh, it's 2003. It was created. Yep. Okay, so 2003, and this just gives. I'm good. You're doing this a little background on the timeline because, I, you know, as a kid, I've been fishing most of my life as well, and I remember my dad back when I was a kid. He used to talk about these Kamloops trips he used to do. And my dad, I think now he's uh, 82. But um, so we'd bring it back to like the 50s, I think, right? He was fishing in maybe the late 50s, early 60s. What has changed, uh, you know, if you look at the 60s, 1960s versus when you started in the 80s and then throughout the 80s, was there, was was it already a, an amazing fishery back in the 60s and 70s? Oh, yeah, I know the, the 60s and 70s were the, you know, the Kamloops area was, was still too far to get to from the largest population uh, centers of BC, being the Vancouver Lower Mainland area, and it was too far for day trips. So, um, you know, those those were the years when uh, stocking programs were uh, really ramped up. We were still able, we were still stocking fishless lakes, lakes that had never been stocked before. So we had this these boom fisheries coming online uh, throughout the interior of the province. And uh, it was, uh, it wasn't until I started in Kamloops in 1974. uh, And at that time we, we had, we only had six lakes that were being managed for quality fishing opportunities. And uh, so we started working on that right away and then slowly expanding that, uh, that program so that, so when you came to the uh, Thompson Nicola region in the Kamloops area to fish, you had a, a diversity of fishing opportunities from lots of family type fisheries to, uh, to those uh, non retention, uh, uh, but uh, artificial fly only type fisheries where the angler had a chance to catch, you know, the biggest fish of his life or her life. So basically, from those early times, say the, you know, the that 50s, 60s when my dad was there, to the time when you came in in the mid 70s. So did the fishing get better, even better, once you started on in that period, or did, was it pretty much just it's always been the same, always been great? We knew we had the uh, resources, the natural resources, though, the uh, nutrient-rich water, and we were starting to see more anglers coming up, and um, certainly a higher interest in. Uh, from anglers that wanted to pursue a, a bigger fish, um, and then everything um, everything kind of hummed along until uh, until the late eighties, early nineties, when access to the interior changed dramatically, and that was when the Coquihalla Highway was built. So this, uh, up until then, the only access to the interior was through uh, the Fraser Canyon Highway 1, uh, which made it a five, five and a half hour journey up into the greater Kamloops area. And when the Coquihalla Highway Phase 1 was built in 1986, it basically cut off two plus hours or more of uh, travel time to get to the interior. And that that made the interior, the Kamloops Merritt area, accessible to day trips from the growing population of 
of anglers living in the Fraser Valley, the uh, uh, outskirts of Vancouver, because Vancouver is getting so large, so more people living in the valley. So now there was this huge population of anglers and hunters uh, that could access the interior on day trips. And that really, really changed the way we uh, had to look at lake management because of the significant increase in effort that we were seeing on these lakes. So that's a big part, and I'm glad you're filling in the timeline here and more. And I also want to dig in, maybe even bring it back in a little bit to like the ge- uh, geology and more of that uh, history even further back. But um, maybe just for people that are thinking about Kamloops, you know, not that we want to add a lot more pressure onto Kamloops, but, you know, if somebody wanted to go up there, didn't know anything about fishing Kamloops, didn't know much about lake fishing or still water you know, where do you start somebody? What, when you, what do you tell them if they're just going to grab, jump in their car and head up to fish that? Where do they start? Is there a good place to help them get started? Yeah. Um, well, the, right now, there's if you if you're planning your first trip to fish lakes, or your first, or you're an ang- already an angler or fly fisher and are coming to camps for the first time, there's just so many resources available. Uh, to uh, help you plan your trip. And that's everything from um, online uh, forums uh, and how-to YouTube uh, videos to uh, books, uh, DVDs, videos, uh, uh, Facebook chat pages on... There's an excellent uh, Facebook page called Stillwater's... uh, BC that uh, you uh, can get uh, enormous amounts of information to help you plan your trip. Uh, and then we've got, um, you know, there's 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 fly shops uh, uh, in, in Kelowna, uh, which is an hour and a half from Kamloops. And also we've finally got another uh, a, a fly shop reopening in Kamloops uh, that will be open actually next week. Uh, we believe it or not, we've had a hard time. We haven't had a fly shop now in Kamloops for a number of years, um, and now we're having a dedicate another shop come opening up. And there's shops in the Greater Vancouver area that also provide a lot of information. So there's there's a tremendous amount of information on um, out there. Plus the resorts uh, that uh, have boat rentals. You know, they now know that there's a a tr- tremendous amount of uh, interest in fly fishing. So their boats are set up with, you know, double anchoring systems and, uh, and, and they're knowledgeable about uh, where, uh, uh, where to fish and how to fish lakes. And there's also guides uh, that work out of Kamloops and other uh, Kelowna and other parts of the interior uh, th- that can uh, um, take you out on the water and certainly, uh, significantly reduce your learning curve. Okay, perfect. And the Kamloops Fly Shop, do you know, uh, by the time this goes out, that should be open, do you know the name of that fly shop? Yeah, so it's it's called Casting Loops, uh, and it, uh, it, it it's in, the, in, uh, in uh, Valley View area of Kamloops, and uh, those of us that live here are, are, are so happy to see a, a shop opening again, and um, and we uh, certainly all wish it, wish the owners well, and uh, and we all you know we know you got to support your local shops. It's it's so critical uh, uh, to support them, and uh, they're part of the community, and uh, they're going to uh, benefit all that live here as well. Nice, nice. And do you know? I'm just curious. It sounds interesting that. You know, there there has never been a fly, or well, there there hasn't recently been a fly ship shop in Kamloops. But um, do you know? Uh, I'm not sure if you know the the owners, and um, maybe talk a little bit about why there hasn't been a fly shop there for a while. You, you know, we we we've had uh, dedicated uh, fly shops in Kamloops in the past, and uh, where we. Um, and, and and they were, you know, they survived. But what happened was, unfortunately, a big box store, uh, similar to a mini Cabela's uh, or um, or uh, 
Bass Pro, but much smaller, uh, opened up a franchise in Kamloops, uh, I guess probably close to 15 years ago now. And uh, unfortunately, it, it, it killed the, uh, the local fly shop. Um, they just couldn't compete with the, you know, what you, you know, I'm sure you've heard this and seen this scenario play out when a large big spot, big box, uh, sporting goods, uh, retailer opens up, it, it just, it just hammers the, uh, the small uh, shop owners. Well, it's really great to hear that there's a new fly shop and I'll, I'll definitely reach out to them and, and help, um, you know, get the word out. That, that's awesome. Uh, so do you feel like when you hear more people coming in, I mean, you're never worried about, especially from your perspective as a biologist, are you ever worried about the pressure having too many people coming in there? Because I, I think, isn't the pressure increasing in Kamloops? You know, uh, th- th- there's no question, you know, there, we're, we're seeing more anglers, but we've also, you know, we stock, you know, you know almost 800 lakes in the, uh, in the province and about 250 lakes, just are probably about 220 lakes in the Kamloops Merritt area. So we have a lot of water to, to, to move people around to. And the, 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 the provincial fisheries biologists who, who are in charge of managing the resources, uh, you know, they're, they're on top of things and they, um, they try to stay on, uh, stay in touch with what's, what's happening on lakes with changing effort. Um, and there's no question it is a, it is a, it is a challenge to, uh, stay abreast of, uh, changes, uh, that are happening in our lakes. And there are changes happening. We're seeing some very significant changes in water chemistry in some lakes, uh, changes in, uh, plant species uh, and then so much of that has to do with uh, the uh, historical and ongoing uh, timber harvesting that occurs in the watersheds and it's changing uh, flow regimes uh, um, when runoff occurs uh, how quickly it starts how quickly it ends Uh, you know when you have significant portions of a watershed in a non non green up stage uh, uh, reforestation, it it uh, impacts uh, water quality, and then we're seeing that. Plus, you know, we look at uh, how our weather patterns, our climate is changing, and uh, getting these uh, longer, intense, uh, much hotter summers. Uh, you know, we're seeing more, you know, we're, we're seeing changes, algal blooms that are occurring on lakes that never did before. But the bottom line is, uh, Dave, that there's still, we have tremendous fishing up here, tremendous insect hatches in our lakes. And uh, to the fly fisher, that means we've got great chronomid emergences, mayflies, damsels, caddis, dragonflies, uh and then we're not when we're not focused on hatches. It's the uh, the scud or freshwater shrimp and leeches are 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 all uh, readily available. So uh, regardless of the time of year you come up, you know there there can be some good fishing. But there's no question when the when you're planning your your trip, uh, regardless of where you're coming from, um, it's the spring months. Uh, you know from ice off until. Uh, towards the end of June and then uh, the late fall months, the latter half of September, all of October, and then well into November. Uh, And for those of us that live up here, you know, we're fishing right until uh, the day the lakes freeze up and, and, and we have spectacular late fall fishing. Great. So there you go. And, and I want to dig, get more into the, uh, you know, kind of the, the season there. Um, but I wanted to bring it back to that timber harvesting. I think that's an interesting piece. Uh, we typically don't get too much into the, some of those topics, but I know, you know, obviously down in the U S we've had a history of clear cutting and it's affected, um, you know, streams, but it, it's happened a long time ago. I mean, it's still occurring, but up in Canada, is this something where, you know, I guess all your forests haven't been clear cut yet, and and you're now on the cusp of seeing more maybe stuff that's happened to us maybe 
100 years ago. I mean, describe a little bit what's what how the timber harvesting is going and, and how what's going on as far as protection. It's been a bit of a double whammy in terms of what's happening to the watersheds, the ecology of the watersheds that all of these lakes sit in. And, uh, you know, probably the, a, a huge impact was the uh, mountain pine beetle uh, because we're such a dominant uh, lodgepole pine forest base, uh, particularly from mid to high elevation. And when pine beetle came through, it it really rocked uh, our watersheds, killing vast tracts of forest. So where you know our, uh, our you know we went into a salvage mode to try to salvage uh, that pine bef- while it was still merchantable. Uh, and so you know we had huge tracts of or swaths of uh, of clear cutting going on in watersheds and. Uh, you know, now we're seeing, um, we're just seeing the effects of, uh, of of this massive removal of conifer forest, uh, and then the slow regeneration time it takes to get green up again. Uh, that uh, you know, the whole uh, cycle of uh, water uh, uh, coming into the watershed, uh, rainfall, snowfall. And then runoff uh, patterns have all changed. Uh, you know, nutrient loading in the lakes in in the spring freshet because there's simply not enough uh, live uh, deciduous and coniferous uh, trees to absorb those nutrients, or they're flushing directly into the into the lake. So we're seeing. Uh, that's why I mentioned earlier we're seeing changes in. Uh, Aquatic plant uh, species uh, is, is changing uh, that way. Uh, pH levels are are also changing in lakes, uh, and they, these are all happening gradually, very slowly over time. But um, it is happening, and uh, we're hoping that uh, you know we're slowly seeing um, you know getting green up to a stage where it's uh, you know those uh, ten to fifteen foot high trees. Uh, Conifers now are, are are providing some uh, protection to the uh, to the water uh, cycles that are occurring in those watersheds. Wow! Yeah, that's um, you know you're painting, and I love I love this discussion. And I maybe if we can get you on again, we'll dig more into some of the um, you know the ecology because it, it is really interesting and the changes and you know, maybe talk about, you know, how people can help. Um, but, um, but I still wanted to go, you know, go back to that process of, you know, getting ready for a fishing trip. Right. So, so you mentioned, you know, ice off, so when does, when does ice off typically start and when would you say is maybe the best time if you had to pick one month to fish up there? Is there a lot of variation there? Or are all the lakes kind of similar? If I had a 30 day window to pick for a trip to the Kamloops area or to really any interior region of the province for the uh, Wonderful stillwater fisheries up here. I would I would take middle of May to the middle of June is is when I would plan a trip. And regardless if you're coming to the Kamloops area, the East or West Kootenays, or to the Caribou, or to the uh, Prince George regions, the northern regions of the province, that would be a prime time to be coming up because you, then you're assured of experiencing. Uh, chronomid emergences, you'll you'll catch some mayflies potentially, and you might even see a bit of early damselfly and uh, uh, caddis activity as well. But it is that that, that 30-day period, mid-May to mid-June, is is prime. Okay, perfect. So that's and that's great. That means right in, and you know, early part of the season, get out there. And you mentioned the chronomid, obviously, you know, and I've had Phil Rowley on the podcast. I've had, you know, Denny Rickards. We've had some Stillwater episodes, and they, they've all been great. Um, it's been a little while, so I want to bring us back to uh, the chronomid because I know this is probably the one aquatic insect that dominates and you, you have to fish it. So can you describe, start us off first with a, a little life cycle of the chronomid, and how does that fit into how somebody would be fishing out there? Yeah, it's um, there's no question that the the most prolonged, the most extensive, 
and the most prolific aquatic insect hatches or emergencies you're going to see in any still water, any productive still water for trout uh, are going to be chronomids or midges. And uh, we're so fortunate in, in uh, these productive waters we have that we're going to see chronomids um, that will imitate on as small as a size 18 uh, scud hook, uh, all the way up to tying chronomid bomber pupil patterns that are tied on a on a uh, 10 2x, 12 3x nymph hook. So they're they're huge. They're almost almost uh, reaching the pupa reaching uh, five eighths to three quarters of an inch. You know, 20 millimeters in uh, in length. So they're big. That's why we call them bombers. So that's uh, that's what you can expect to run into, depending on the time of the year you're up here. And in any given lake, there could be 15 or 20 different species of chronomids in that lake. So 15 or 20 different sizes and colors of of pupa that the trout are going to be uh, feasting on. And uh, typically. Uh, Early spring, the chronomerger emergences start in shallow water, and as the water temperatures slowly uh, increase, they progress out in, into deeper water. Um, and so we'll start the season off often uh, fishing in water, definitely 10 feet or less. Um, but by uh, um, late May and early June, we're seeing emergences in 15 to 20, 25 feet of water. And then we get deep water hatches that occur in many lakes uh, that could be uh, anywhere from 30 feet to 70, 80 feet in depth. Uh, and some of those deep water hatches start early, even before the shallow water hatches. So it's it's kind of unique. There's several lakes that have these unique deep water hatches that start in the spring months before the shallow water ones happen and so that's obviously got something to do with water temperature at the, those deeper depths because as, as we know everything in it doesn't matter where it's rivers or lakes everything is driven by water temperature and so the maturation of the chronomid larva the transformation from the larva to the pupa and the emergence of the pupa into the adult it's all driven by water temperature that's great yeah thanks for uh <clears throat> thanks for doing that brian that's you know, there's so much involved in the uh, life cycle of aquatic insects. And, you know, we're not going to get deep into entomology and things like that. But I think it is interesting because there's some confusion. I've actually had guests on the show and people, you know, talk about how maybe some of the guests have said things that haven't been totally clear. Can you, for the pupae, can you just describe the difference between like a, a pupae and the different uh, stages of the chronomid? So the chronomid has a, a complete metamorphosis. So chronomids are midges, so they go from an egg to the larval stage, to the pupil stage, to the adult stage. And the larval stage of the chronomid typically lives at the mud water interface at the bottom of the lake. And that could be in five feet of water, or it could be in 55 feet of water. The larvae are segmented and they're worm-like in shape, and they have pro-legs at the, each end of their uh, larvae. So uh, they, they, they build a very loose, uh, like shelters in, in the bottom of the lake, in the mud water or marl water interface, and they stick their heads out and they feed on detritus, decomposing plant matter vegetation that, that's, that's at the accumulates at the bottom of the lake and the, the typical chronomid life cycle is one year uh, although there are numerous species that have um, multiple gener can have multiple generations in the same year and there are some species it's usually the big guys that have a two-year life cycle so for depending on the species from one year to two year the chronomid larvae will live in its tube at the bottom of the lake. And once it's fully matured, uh, it'll seal itself inside that little tube at the bottom of the lake, and it'll transform from that segmented worm-like uh, stage 
into the chronomid pupil stage. So you're going to have uh, the, pro the chronomid pupa 95% developed inside that old larval tube at the bottom of the lake. When that pupa is ready to emerge, it breaks out of that old larval shock and begins a slow ascent, vertical ascent to the surface of the lake. Again, in 5, 55, 75, 90 feet of water. To aid its, its migration to the surface, it, uh, the chronomid pupa releases gas under its outer cuticle, which makes the pupa appear shiny or chromied like And that gas helps the pupa elevate to the surface of the lake. And as soon as that pupa reaches the surface of the lake, a split will form on the back of its thorax and the adult chronomid will wiggle out, sit on the water very briefly, a few seconds at best, and then fly off the shore. Within 24 hours of flying to shore, the uh, female chronomid uh, will have egg, an egg sac, they'll be fertilized, and then the females will come back to the lake, usually in the late evening, early morning hours, and uh, came across the lake, dipping the tip of her abdomen in the surface film and releasing the next generation of chronomids. And the adult, uh, adult chronomids uh, don't have uh, feeding mouth parts, and so they basically can live maximum 48 hours, and then they die. Yeah, so that's the life cycle, uh, and obviously, where where the fish become so focused is I is, is typically while well, they they do feed on the chronomid larvae by basically swimming right right along the bottom of the lake and then sucking the larvae out of their tubes, but 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 what really focuses the trout attention are these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of chronomid pupa that have just emerged from their old larval shocks, got their head up, tail down, and they're wiggling right at the bottom, within a foot, foot and a half of the bottom, and they're jet getting prepared to ascend to the surface of the lake. And of course, they eat them as they ascend as well. But when they're concentrated at the bottom prior to their emergence swim, they're extremely vulnerable. They can't uh, hide, they can't dive back down in the mud, they're totally exposed and they make an easy, highly nutritious meal for trout and other fish species. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Koffler Boats specialize in custom ordered aluminum boats and uses the best materials, components, and accessories available to meet all of your fishing and boating needs. The Jet Drifter, a perfect powerboat for shallow water rivers or lakes, will perform with as little as a 35 horsepower prop engine, but the whole design will also accept larger engines. In addition, the Jet Drifter is also designed to be rowed. The Jet Drifter can be custom built in 14 foot through 18 foot lengths, and uh, I've been rowing Koffler drift boats for most of my life. I remember going down the river in my dad's Koffler boat when I was a kid. And since I have transitioned into the 17 by 54 drift boat, perfect for packing a ton of gear and still staying nimble. If you need a bulletproof boat that can literally sit outside all year long when not in use and take a beating, Koffler has the boat for you. Whether a jet drifter, drift boat, Rocky Mountain trout boat, or sled, Koffler has you covered. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Koffler to connect with Joe and the family today. That's Koffler, K-O-F-F-L-E-R right now. Wetflyswinging.com slash Koffler. You support our podcast by clicking over through that link to connect with Joe. Please let Joe know you heard of the ad through the podcast when you connect and check back with me to celebrate if you end up making a purchase. Now let's get back to the rest of the show. Maybe just start us off, you know, let's again take it back to say we're in early June we're out there fishing early, mid-June. Is there a time of the day during that day, you know, say you're up there today, that, that the chronomid is better fishing like either mornings or afternoons? 
you know, chronomet emergencies typically they keep really good hours. They typically start nine thirty, ten o'clock in the morning, and then they'll uh, they'll build to early afternoon, and then by late afternoon they're uh, they're finished. So they take advantage of the rising, slightly rising water temperatures to get the hatch going, and then it builds and then subsides. So you you basically have a you know a our four to six hour window when the trout or potential are going to be most focused on feeding on those pupa. So if we're in the middle of June and we're in this hypothetical scenario, it's the middle of June, we're out on the water rowing out or putting out in our boat, our pontoon boat, and we see shucks and we see adults emerging from those shucks and we look at our depth sounder and it's uh, 19 feet deep. So we, we've got a choice here, 19 feet deep. There's three ways we can approach fishing the people. We know they're coming off, and actually we're probably seeing them on our sounder a foot, a foot and a half off the bottom. So we can fish a strike indicator with a long leader, suspending that fly a foot off the bottom, or we can take the indicator off and fish a long tapered sinking leader um, and uh if we were in 19 feet of water, I would be fishing with a leader at least 25, 26 feet in length to your fly. Um, and then we call that fishing naked. And so we, we could fish that way as well by making a long cast, waiting for that fly. Or in, uh, if, you're in a, if you're allowed to fish multiple flies, you know, your uh, uh, dropper system, for those two two flies to get down to the bottom and then initiating a slow hand twist retrieve as you bring your flies across horizontally through the potential feeding zones of that fish just off the bottom. And then the third way that you can fish in that 19 feet of water is you can you can actually deep line. You can take your type six, type seven full sinking line, a three foot piece of tippet material your pupa pattern on and then uh, clip a, a weight or a pair of hemostats on your fly, lower the fly, fly line over the side of the boat, uh, touch bottom, pull your fly line in a foot, uh, lift your, pull your line out of the water, take the hemostats or, or weight off, flip the line back over and put your rod in the rod holder uh, or hold it, one of the two, and, and we call that dangling or deep lining where you're fishing vertically straight up and down. And uh, you want to make sure you're holding your rod or it's in a rod holder because when you dangle, the strikes are, for some reason, are vicious and they'll they'll take the rod over the side of the boat if you're not, if you don't have it securely uh, fastened. But obviously the most common and, uh, and still the most effective way is with the indicator. Um, and especially for a beginner using a strike indicator, um, but again, if you're in 19 feet of water, we have to remember that the fish not typically eat a few chronomids at 18 feet and then swim up to 12 feet and then back down to 13 feet or back up to 8 feet and feed. They'll focus their feeding in a very narrow depth zone, and it could be between 18 and 17 feet or it could be between 18 and a half and 17 and a half feet. And if you're a, a foot out of that zone above it, you'll catch far fewer fish than if your boat partner, for instance, is in the zone. You're just out of it and those fish just get extremely focused on how wide of a depth zone they'll travel to feed on those chronomids. So this isn't just a tie a chronomid on, chuck it out there, doesn't matter as long as it's not sitting on the bottom. You got to think about, you know, the, the feeding tactics, strategies that that trout, brook trout, even kokanee, uh, lake white fish, uh, all these species love to eat chronomids. Even lake trout uh, um, love to eat chronomids when the water temperature is cool enough for them. But it's always fishing your pupil patterns much, much closer to the bottom 
and higher in the water column. Okay, close to the bottom. Okay, and and what just describe uh, a couple of patterns that that are pretty much if somebody had to pick a co- two patterns to go with to imitate the pupil, uh, what would that be? What would you go with? Well, if we you know if we only had two patterns, um, choose one would be a dark bodied one, and one would be a uh, homied up uh, coloration. So standard go to dark colored pattern or black bead or a metal gray bead with some white antrino for the gills. And that's going to be tied on anything from a scud hook to a to, uh, 2X dim. And then ribbing the fly with uh, different colors of copper wire. Uh, it could be black, it could be green, it could be red copper, brown copper, uh, or natural copper. Uh, or you could rib it with different colors of thread. But you, you're, you're trying to imitate that illusion of trap gas, and then we're going to be fishing that pattern uh, or finishing that pattern off again with either a white bead or a, a brown magic bead or black bead or a, or a, um, a gunmetal gray type bead, um, adding a, a man on under the bead to imitate the gills. So a dark pattern and then and a uh, silvered up or a, a lighter pattern that imitates that trap cast or the, or the way to start uh, your days off on those uh, on the chronomet emergencies. Okay, perfect. And as far as the boat, I'm imagining that most people are fishing, you know, out of a boat. There's lots of different boats you could have. Is it, you know, I mean, I guess, what, what would you recommend? What's, what's if somebody's coming up there, uh, you know, a drift boat, a john boat, what, what do you, what's the easiest, best boat? So you, you can fish still waters in, in any watercraft that, uh, that you can double anchor, basically. So float tubes, it's hard to double anchor, but pontoon boats, uh, drift boats, uh, rafts, and conventional hull boats um, all work fine. And um, for those that are very, very serious about this, uh, we fish out of prams or john boats, flat bottom boats that are extremely stable, double anchoring them. You're laying down floors, carpeting on the floors, and then you know your fishing platform isn't going to move. Um, and it's essential to double anchor uh, if you can, because there's nothing more frustrating than having one anchor out, two of you in the boat fishing, and continuously changing wind direction. You have no control over your retrieves, uh, whether you're using floating lines or sinking lines, and, and regardless of what patterns you're fishing from chronomets to dragon fly nymphs, you're both swinging back and forth. So frustrating. Have that second anchor out. Okay, perfect, perfect. So have the, that's a great tip on the two anchors. So, so again, we're we're taking it to the lake, and I'm not sure which uh, lake we're going to be hitting. But you know, you mentioned caribou, and I mean, I guess there's lots of different sizes sizes of lakes. I guess maybe on that uh, the size of the lake does does that matter? I mean, if again somebody's coming up there new. I'm imagining a smaller lake might be easier to fish. Is that true? You know, um, there's everything uh, lake-wise from small 10-acre, surface-acre lakes to, you know, over 1,000, 2,000-acre lakes that are good stillwater fly fisheries. So it all depends on, on, you know, what you're comfortable fishing, the boat that you have, um, whether you've got a, an outboard motor on it so you can get around. But there, many of the lakes are 150 surface acres or less, so they're ideal for, you know, a pontoon boat or electric motor or a small four, four-stroke uh, uh, outboard motor. Um, and, you know, when you when you come, you're going to come to BC to fish, um, you can you can go online and, down, look at the fishing regulations for the province for and for each region. And you know, if you go to the Thompson Nicola region, for instance, where the where Kamloops and where I live, you'll you'll see 150 plus lakes listed individually. That's because those lakes have specific regulations, and that's how you find lakes that are managed for quality fishing. They'll be catch and lease or one fish or two fish limits. 
they'll be artificial lures or artificial fly only. They'll have bait bands on them, and they'll be closed in the winter to ice fishing. So those are obviously lakes that are designed to grow bigger fish. And then you can also go online to the Freshwater Fish Society of BC's website, gofishbc.com, and you can look up the current stocking rates and histories for every lake in the province that's stocked so that you can look at a lake that you're thinking of going to because it's got quality restrictions on it, check the stocking records and see that it's stocked very lightly every year with triploid or non-reproductive rainbow trout or non-reproductive uh, brook trout. And so you can use those resources um, to help refine your lake search um, as well as while you're while you're on the Goldfish BC site, many of the lakes that are listed uh, with stocking records and access, they'll also have a downloadable uh, PDF contour map that you can uh, also uh, access and help you figure out the structure of the lake. So again, as we talked about earlier, Dave, there's lots of resources out there to help plan and refine your your trip to British Columbia. Perfect. Yeah, and this is great because, I mean, obviously, and you're a great resource, you know, I mean, you've got some books out there. I know uh, one of your books, I think it was the one with Morris, uh, I've had on my shelf since I was a, a kid. I'm not sure. Wh- when did you when did you publish? Maybe talk about that book when that was published and some of the other stuff that you have out there. Oh, Skip and I, Skip Morris and I uh, wrote that book, I guess, back in the early 90s. And uh, we've updated it once and then re printed it a number of times and actually we just a couple of years ago bought the right to the boot, uh, book pardon me and uh, we reprinted it again um, and so it's, it's been a staple uh, lots of good information here to get you going and uh, Phil Rowley has just released a excellent uh, Stillwater book uh, that's uh, very detailed and uh, another book that uh, is, is just going to help you so much in learning how to fish lakes, regardless of where you're living. Um, you know, fishing lakes, fishing anywhere, as you know, fresh freshwater, saltwater rivers, lakes, it's a lifelong journey. We're always learning. Every day when I'm out on the water, I learn something. And that's what keeps us coming back. There's days when we catch a few fish, and there's days we catch lots of fish. And uh, the mix of those uh, experiences are are, are just what makes it so much fascinating to be back on the water every day. Perfect, perfect. And the um, it's fly fishing. Uh, I think it's fly fishing trout lakes, right? That's the name of your book. Yes, it, it's uh, it's Morrison Chan fly fishing trout lakes. All right, great. Well, and I want to take us back just because you know, and I know we've been uh, skipping around a little bit on you know the techniques and tactics and and where you're going, but I'm just trying to prepare somebody. You know, if they if they want to put together a trip up there, how to you know, maybe have a few tips to get going. You know, as far as getting back to the fishing, anything else we want to dig into here? Let's just say we're, we're focusing on, um, you know, the indicator fishing. Uh, as far as maybe just going to the gear really quick, you mentioned some lines and things like that. What do we need as far as rods and line weight and stuff like that? We need more than just uh, a floating line to, to fish lakes. You know, we, we want the floating line so that we can fish with indicators and also nymph or fish naked. And then at least three other sinking lines, uh, an intermediate sinking line or clear camel intermediate sinking line, and then a type three full sinking line, and then a type six or type seven full sinking line. So those three sinking lines will allow you to fish all the different food sources that you're going to encounter from the very shallow portions of the shoal right out into the midwater or deep water depths of the lake. I've always recommended that for your floating line setup, which we do spend a lot of time fishing, that we're using a rod that's nine and a half to 10 feet in length and five or six weight. That's, that's, and preferably I like 10 foot rods when I'm fishing floating lines. And it just, it's, um, it's easier to handle long leaders um, and, and, and strike indicators with that longer rod as well. And then when you're fishing, or considering rods for fishing your sinking lines, then it, we're talking nine or nine and a half foot rods, a shorter rod, because we're fishing with lines that are 
heavier and they're going to drop faster, pull down to the water. So to keep those lines aerialized, we want a, a shorter rod that speeds up our casting stroke, keeps the line aerialized, and then can cast uh, those heavier six and seven weight lines. So I might be using a six or seven weight sinking rod system in, in nine foot would be what I like to use. Um, so you can't, you can't just go out on the water with just the one line. Um, and then when we're fishing with indicators, just remember for fishing deeper water, we're using a quick release indicator. Fishing shallow water, you can fish a fixed indicator uh, because we can, if we're fishing 12 feet of water or less with a fixed indicator, we can, with a 10 foot rod, we can still bring that fish to the, to the boat and land them in your uh, landing net. Uh, but when we're fishing 15 to 25 feet of water, we need a quick release indicator so we can get that, strip the leader in up through the guides and get that fish close enough uh, to the boat and land it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And on the indicator, what is there a name of, of that type of, or a brand or something like this so somebody can take a look at it, the quick release? Yeah, that, that quick release. So uh, Phil has a quick release indicator that uh, we sell on our, uh, Phil and I operate a uh, online uh, Stillwater Fly Fishing Store. It's called StillwaterFlyFishingStore.com. We, we 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 sell our flies that we've designed as well as our books and uh, indicators and uh, a few other uh, throat pumps, things like that. Uh, um, and uh, that's where you can access those uh, quick release indicators or uh, I'm sure you can uh, get them at most fly shops at least in uh, uh, throughout the Western states and uh, Western Canada. Okay, perfect. And, and we've mentioned uh, Phil Rowley a, a few times, and like I said, he's been on the show. And it seems like, you know, you guys, you and Phil are kind of the the two people out there when you think of still water fishing. Are there, I mean, are there other people out there? Um, I mean, you mentioned a few mentors. Maybe you could highlight who those mentors were, and then if there's any other people out there now that are that are kind of doing what you guys do. So many years ago when I moved to Kamloops as a young uh, young fisheries biologist, I, I was uh, mentored by the late Jack Shaw, um, who wrote uh, two books way back in the early 70s uh, about fly fishing in lakes. And uh, he was an extremely insightful, knowledgeable angler who really pioneered chronomet fishing. And if you think back then into the mid 70s, we did not have strike indicators. Uh, we fished most of our chronomets with uh, thinking lines at that time. And we didn't have all these wonderful fly tying materials, we didn't have beads, we didn't have synthetic materials, but he was very aware of the importance of chronomets and uh, people didn't even know what they were then. So he was a very, uh, very strong force in, uh, in, in my upbringing and my development as a stillwater angler. And, and today there's, uh, there, there's, uh, there's numerous uh, still younger stillwater anglers that are providing information online. Uh, Jordan Ulrich out of uh, Salmon Arm, uh, provides information online, uh, has uh, online courses he offers, uh, in, um, and many of them with uh, with Phil. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you if you go online these days, uh, or and is going to you, most of these guys have YouTube channels as well. So there's a ton of information out there uh, locally uh, in Kamloops uh, as a group of uh, younger anglers, uh, FlyGuys.net. That provide a lot of great information for the new angler right to the experienced angler and <clears throat> it's an extremely valuable resource for visiting anglers as well about what's happening uh, on the local fisheries in the greater Kamloops merit areas okay yeah perfect yeah thanks for those resources you know and there's going to be a few things we're not going to go into you know I wanted to you know definitely you know, maybe next time if we can get you back on, um, uh, Brian, we could talk about maybe some of that geology and some of the history. But I want to just keep on the fishing because, again, we're, we're coming up there and, 
talking about getting ready for the trip. What is anything else we want to cover here as far as the fishing? Let's take it back again. We're in June. We're fishing. Uh, maybe we've got the indicator. How are you, you know, talk about maybe how are you finding fish uh, in the lake if you don't know if it's your first time there? So we're, okay, so we're back up fishing in, uh, in mid-June and uh, obviously we're hoping we're going to see some chronomets. But how I would approach my day on the water is I would start fishing with leeches. Um, that's a great searching pattern at that time of year. And I would be fishing them on an indicator. And ideally, if I had a nice breeze, I would be wind drifting those leeches just off the bottom in the depth of fishing. Or I'd be casting directly upwind into a nice gentle breeze and then having a dead uh, drag free drift back to the boat and all I'm doing is picking up the slack of my fly line. It's an extremely effective way to fish. And my leeches would be tied on a 60 degree jig hook and probably using uh, one of these Insta jig uh, uh, tungsten bead heads that make the fly sit balanced or horizontal in the water. Um, And if I wasn't catching a few fish early, just so I can get a fish big enough to do a, a throat sample on. I wasn't getting them on the leeches. I'd I'd be switching to a blob. So uh, a blob pattern imitates a little cluster of zooplankton because by mid-June, we're getting into thicker or denser populations of zooplankton. And uh, so fish will graze on them um, early in the morning as well uh, as leeches. So just think, start searching patterns first before we get hopefully, to the start of the cronmid hatch. And then, you know, you've got that little aquarium net with you that you can dip things out of the water, dip shocks, dip an emerging cronmid, dip a pupa that's just wiggling up to the surface, and uh, they can tell you so much about size, color, or what's coming off, or whether it's mayfly nymphs that are coming off. And then the key is getting that first fish that's 14 to 16 inches in length, big enough to do a throat pump on, so that you can live sample the last few food items in the throat of the fish, uh, never taking that fish out of the water and then letting them slip out of the net and swim away and resume his feeding. So think about, you got to think about how you approach your day on the water, uh, knowing that the hatches aren't going to start right away. So think about bread and butter food sources that those fish will be feeding on or potentially feeding on at that time of the year. All right. Nice. And uh, so that's a great tip. So basically, yeah, you can get started out there. You mentioned sometimes, you know, 9, 30, 10 a.m. You might have these coronamid hatches, but potentially you could also start earlier. I mean, do you ever start right at that kind of daybreak and fish early in the morning? You know, when we're in these these uh, very hot times in the summertime, uh, I'll, if it, what a temperature still cool enough early in the morning, I'll go out at five, six o'clock in the morning and fish for a few hours Um and I know there's not going to be any hatches or anything, but it's a great time to poke around the edges of the drop-off uh, with leeches and uh, dragonfly nymphs um, and catch fish that are still cruising around uh, in that nice, cool water just on the edges of the shoals as they slip in, slip off into the deep, deeper zones of the lake over the edge of the drop-off. Okay, yeah, perfect. So, so, there is, so you could pretty much go out there and fish most of the day and it's just a matter like any type of fishing just exploring find out try to figure out what's coming off what's hatching what the fish are eating um yeah i mean it's it, obviously there's a lot to this we didn't talk a lot about fishing the intermediate line maybe, maybe you can just touch on that quickly when, when would you fish an intermediate sinking line versus say uh one of those deeper is it just depth of water and even in in, in mid-june water temperatures are often cool enough that the fish are still uh, definitely in that shallow water. So fast stripping shrimp or scud patterns in that shallow water, particularly early in the morning. Um, and then the same with leeches. Uh, again, maybe picking up the pace a bit on a bit of a fast retrieve, try to try to uh, entice an aggressively feeding fish to come and chase that leech down or that shrimp down. Are always good uh, methods. Uh, tactics to try in the morning. And obviously, when we get out on the lake, you know, we're cruising around looking for moving fish. 
So if it's seven o'clock in the morning on June the 15th, I'm cruising around and I see two or three fish move or they may jump or they just may rise or boil or swirl, but the water's only six feet deep. I'm in there right now and I'll be putting on an intermediate or uh, type one, three full sinking line and I'll be casting shrimp or leeches uh, just to see if I can get uh, a, one of those uh, active fish that are in that shallow water to bite. I know it's too early for any chronomus to hatch, but it'll it'll give me an opportunity to uh, get a, again get a fish that's big enough to potentially do a throat sample on and find out what's exactly going on. Okay, yeah. So that's your key. The, your key again is get, getting that first fish. So you can really verify what they're eating because they could be eating, like you said, lots of different things throughout the day. Um, and then on the indicator, go back to the indicator. So you can fish either an indicator or you don't have to fish an indicator. Um, but w- when would you want to, when do you start putting on your indicator? Um, so when, when we get into the, the midst of a good chronomid hatch and, and we're definitely, if you're in water, you know, 12, 15 feet and less, then the indicator can be your best friend for um, um, catching or fooling a lot of fish. But there are times when fish do not want to eat a chronopupa suspended under an indicator. And oftentimes that's when it's flat calm out. That means the fish want to see a little bit of movement. So you, if you're fishing with an indicator, you've got to put some movement into your fly, meaning every 30, 40 seconds, give your fly line a few quick pulls to make the indicator move. But alternatively, you switch to your floating line and a, and a sinking leader. And, uh, you know, you're in 15 feet of water, so you'd have a 20, 22 foot long leader uh, to your fly or a set of flies waiting, doing a, you know, waiting a minute, minute and a half for the leader to sink, make sure you're close to the bottom. And you'll know you're close if you snag up, then you know the next cast shorten up. And then beginning a very slow hand twist retrieve and bringing that fly horizontally uh, through the water column, but right along, just off the bottom where the fish are potentially and most likely feeding. So indicator works a lot of the time, but sometimes they don't want that fish, they don't want the fly static, and those are times when you want to consider fishing uh, naked without an indicator. Gotcha. Okay, so that's a great tip. So if it's if it's really calm and, and you need a little bit of movement, the indicator isn't best. But otherwise, if you wanted to fish the indicator, you know, you, you, are you fishing? I mean, what percentage of time are you fishing indicators during your uh, typical day for you? During the spring months, I'm probably fishing the indicator 70% of the time, um, but as we get into into the mid June, late June into July, you know I'm, I'll be fishing um, naked fishing indicator with no indicator, or fishing uh, sinking lines more and more. And it's it's also just a, it's also part of the function of the fish sliding into deep water because those shallower areas of the lake are getting too warm during the day, so they're sliding off to the edges of the drop-off, into the deep water zone. And uh, some th- at those times, we can be more effective with full sinking lines. Okay. All right, great. All right, Brian, well, I'm gonna, we're going to get out of here in a little bit. I, before we do, I wanted to touch on one thing I think is really uh, pretty powerful, the, you know, the way we're doing this interview. And um, I know I talked to you, I don't know how long it was, but you mentioned that you had some issues with your hearing and you couldn't do the podcast. And now as we speak, right, you're, you're, this is being transcribed uh, through otter.ai, which is an amazing product. Talk about um, a little bit about, you know, I'm not sure what happened with your hearing, but take us there. How did that feel? And did you feel at some point you weren't going to ever be able to do what we're doing right now? You know, life is, is always a, throws a few curveballs to you. And I guess three years ago, I um, over a 48-hour period, I lost, a huge or significant portion of my hearing. It, it was sudden neurological hearing loss. And uh, it, it continued to uh, decline to the point where um, um, I uh, was assessed for a cochlear implant because uh, uh, normal hearing aid wasn't going to be of any value to me. 
And so, uh, you know, I was fortunate to uh, have an implant uh, back in uh, spring, early spring of 2020, and I've, you know, regained my a significant portion of my hearing. It's definitely not perfect, and I am challenged hearing uh, over the phone. Um, we're, I'm just so lucky. There's uh, there's apps out there that uh, you can uh, get to help transcribe live uh, while you're talking, and uh, those are the things I I rely on now. But I'm so grateful to uh, to have, have had a opportunity to get an implant. You know, our medical system in Canada is a little different than the states. And in in BC, uh, uh, the province only funds uh, uh, 40 implants a year for the entire province. So, uh, you know, there's a waiting game to 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 get one because it is fully covered by our by our health system. So I I was I was fortunate to get one and. Uh, um, so happy to be able to hear again, and uh, <laughs> I'm hoping everybody is happy to hear from me again as well. Yeah, no, I definitely, definitely, Brian. I've, yeah, I was really uh, excited to hear that you know you were kind of getting, you know, fixing that obviously an implant, and it's great to hear. I think, you know, I mean, you probably maybe are the most impactful. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, one of your ment- mentors a while back, but I mean, in our, in my history, I mean, you have been the name out there, right? Even, I mean, Phil, I know came in a little bit later and now he's, he's a giant name out there as well, but for Stillwater, you've always, it's been you and uh, Denny Rickards, you know, down here, we got Denny Rickards, who's a, who's a character. Um, but, um, no, it's, it's good. And, um, so before, you know, before we uh, take it out of here, Brian, just give us, we have this little segment, um, I call the, uh, the two, 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 twenty two. And it's uh, the top two tips, top flies, and top resources. And I think we've covered everything. We've covered flies. We've covered some resources. Um, but what about tips? So take it to the water again. So somebody's sitting there on the water. Maybe they're struggling to get a fish. It's it's maybe noon, midday. You know, is there a couple of tips you would give that person? Yeah. You know, so so two tips, and I've probably covered this already, but watch for moving fish. And a moving fish doesn't necessarily feed, mean that fish is feeding, but it tells you there's more than one or two actively swimming fish in an area. And if you're not seeing fish in the area you're fishing, then pull those anchors and get over there. I'm always scanning the water looking for active fish. I have a three fish rule. If I see three fish move, I'm out of here and I'm going to go. My second tip would be be patient. There's always, in most days out there, something is going to happen. And it, if it's in the middle of June and uh, nothing's happened all morning, you know, no chronomets came off, but at 2.30 in the afternoon, calabas mayflies started to emerge. So if you decided, no, oh, heck, it's not going to happen, it's noon, you know, I'm not catching anything. I'm going home. Well, at 2.30, the hatch did come off. It wasn't chronomets, but it was mayflies, and you've missed it. So be patient. Have some patience. Try different techniques. Don't be afraid to go out into deep water and throw some boobies, hang some blobs, uh, just uh, fish some dragonfly nymphs off the edges of drop-off. You know, have a look around the lake and... Uh, but have the patience to wait uh, for something to happen and be prepared to try sometimes things out of the box. Perfect. Yeah, those are awesome. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned boobies, Brian. So I can't I can't leave that one. Uh, talk about uh, I know I'm not sure if that's one of Phil's flies, but talk about the booby fly. What what is that imitating out there? Have we talked a little bit about the the insect or what it's imitating? Yeah, I, that's the first time I mentioned boobies was at the very end, and I just wanted to see if you were going to bite. <laughs> Got me. So, you know, boobies are, you know, something brought over from the UK across the pond. Um, why fish bite them? I believe it's because it's they don't represent any, represent any food source. That's for sure. It's it's something annoying, quick quickly stripped through the water that creates a lot of commotion in the water, and it brings out an aggressive response from oftentimes 
the most aggressively feeding fish or a fish that wants to chase something it doesn't like out of its territory. So regardless of why that fish ate the fly, um, the booby fly, the uh, booby can be an extremely effective pattern at times. And when they, for me, when they seem to work best is during the summer doldrums when there's not a lot of other uh, insect hatches because they've all come and gone. And so we're back to fishing bread and butter food sources. So you can shake things up by hooking up your type seven, type six full sinking line, short four foot leader, um, tie your booby on with a non-slip loop knot and bomb it out, out in the deep water uh, and then let her sink right down and then fast strip retrieve in four to six inch rapid uh, strip retrieve uh, and even using what we call a roly-poly retrieve where you tuck the cork of your rod under your armpit and then use a two hand over complete uh, roly-poly retrieve using two both hands pulling it in and um, as I said it'll uh, can often elicit a very aggressive strike and um, we see all different colors of, of boobies, uh, different colored eyes, foam eyes as well. Um, and some days one color work better than others. So it's an ex it's a, it's an experimentation type of day when you're using them. But um, I always am prepared to try to fish them. Um, at uh, regardless of the time of year, I'll always, if things are tough, I'll always stick a a booby on and give it a whirl. There you go. All right. So the booby, the booby is a good one. And, and, uh, you know, just overall, Brian, I know, you know, from what you've done, uh, you know, managing for 30 years, the, the fishery up there and probably, you know, maybe the, the, the greatest place for fi uh, trout fishing in the lakes. And I think you're guiding now. I mean, you're doing a ton of stuff. How, you know, over all that time, what's been your secret? How have you been able to do all that stuff? Is there, is that your superpower that you could just do everything? Or is there anything you haven't done yet before you get out of here? Oh, no, I just, I just look forward to getting out on the water. Um, and it, 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 you know, it may not, in, in August, we have some great river fisheries around Kamloops and I love getting out on the flow, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, swinging my uh, two-handed trout spay rod and uh, over some riffles and uh, catching some wild rainbow trout in our local rivers as well. So regardless of where it is, I just love being out on the water. Perfect. Well, and obviously we're not going to have time to dig into trout spay here. Um, but uh, before we get out, is anything, you know, just want to give a, leave us with something in the next, uh, you know, upcoming for you in the next six months to a year? Uh, anything new with, I'm not sure, I know we didn't talk about the Stillwater app, but anything else you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, no, Phil and I certainly have the Stillwater app that we're uh, continually updating. And it's, it's a great resource for, uh, for all levels, all skill levels of anglers. And for me personally, I've, in the next six months, I've just, finished filming a, uh, ma a master class for uh, April Volke's Anchored Outdoors uh, site, and we're just going through the editing now. It's a master class on fishing chronomids, so it's like 25 chapters uh, that you'll be able to watch online on everything about chronomid fishing. And I'm still, still I've shot a few shows this spring, uh, and I'll shoot a few more this fall with Sport Fishing on the Fly TV show. Um, and I'm also doing a, a little bit of guiding, uh, you know, uh, COVID kind of put a halt on that last year for me and for the start of this year. But now that, uh, we're getting all getting fully vaccinated, uh, I'm taking a few guests out, not right this time of year, cause it's just simply too hot. It's too, too tough on the fish stocks as well as the anglers. Um, but in the fall, I'll be certainly taking a few guests out, uh, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the fall is a wonderful time to be out on our still waters. But it's cool, it's cold, but those fish come into shallower and shallower water as those water temperatures drop. So yeah, still busy, all related to being out on the water and, and, and loving what I'm able to do. All right, Brian. Hey, and what uh, what about a lodge? Do you have a favorite lodge? It doesn't have to be Kamloops, but somewhere where you've been or, you know, uh kind of a lodge or a destination? 
you know, I've been to a lot of great lodges, uh, and there's some there's some great places uh, in in the Kamloops area, uh, Caverhill Lake uh, Resort, uh, Roche Lake Resort, um, even Tunk Tunkwa Lake Resort offers some great fishing opportunities. Even in August, we have a summer bomber hatch there, and then one of my you know one of my favorite places to visit uh, for a des- semi destination uh, trip for me is is fishing up in the Yukon in the Northwest Territories uh, for fly fishing for lake trout, lake whitefish, and northern pike. And one of my favorite places to go to is Klawani Wilderness uh, Lodge in the Yukon on Wellesley Lake, a phenomenal still water. It's just like fishing a huge productive still water right in downtown Kamloops, except you're way up in the Yukon and wonderful lake trout, uh, lake whitefish, and northern pike fly fishing uh it's just spectacular amazing brian all right hey well i'll let you get out of here i just wanted to thank you again and for everybody else for all the the work you've put in all these years i know it's been a a passion and you know i know you probably don't think of it as work because you love it but i think everybody out here who's experienced uh cam loops or will experience it i want to thank you in advance for that so yeah have have a good day and thanks for taking the time yeah it's uh thanks very much dave it's uh it's taken us a couple of years to get connected and uh, thanks for your patience. And uh, yeah, hopefully I look forward to doing another one of these talks with you sometime in the future. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 243, 243. We are digging uh, digging back into the Members Society, uh, wetflyswing.com slash members if you want to support this podcast for about the price of a cup of coffee. Uh, we're over there uh, chatting a little bit, and you can answer some questions if you have a topic, anything you want to bring us specifically. This is where I dig into uh, the content first. So check it out, wetflyswing.com slash members. That's pretty much a wrap for today. That's all I have for you. Uh, I'm trying to think what we have coming up next. I don't think I have something scheduled right now, but uh, we do have some big things coming, like I mentioned. So uh, if you stick around this year, we're going to be doubling down on things and I think uh, blowing blowing you away with some good stuff. So I need to hear from you if you get a chance. Uh, send me a DM on Instagram if you're over there or just an email, uh, wetflyswing, uh, Dave at wetflyswing.com. And uh, let me know. I need to find uh, some more topics. I want to hear from you, hear what you are interested in, where you're coming from, and how I can help you. Uh, appreciate you. Appreciate the support. And uh, looking forward to uh, maybe catching up with you on the on the river, maybe on the uh, on the salt water, or maybe online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.